All right, thanks. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the last colloquium of the year. Uh, our speaker today is Jacqueline Faraday, uh, an expert in observations of brown dwarfs. Uh, she did her graduate work um, at Stony Brook, uh, also spending time at American Museum of Natural History. Uh, she was first an NSF fellow at uh, University of Chile and is now a Hubble fellow um, at uh, uh, Carnegie. Wow, I am. <laughs> in the terrestrial Med Yeah. Um, she's going to be telling us about uh, her work on brown dwarf kinematics. I think that's it. Okay, great. Thank you. made massive improvements since last time I was here. So any bit, which is, which is great, right? Like one year has gone by and I could tell by looking through my previous slides that, man, we've done a lot of stuff over one year. Um, so I get to tell you about all of that for anybody that was at my uh, talk last year. For those wondering, this is a movie that I've rendered, which is a flight through, um, starting in the, close to the solar system and flying out. And you can see the Kepler planets in here and other directly imaged exoplanets, RV planets, other transiting planets close in, kind of fly out of the galaxy. I make a lot of these movies. If anybody's interested in them, we can talk later. Uh, but the title of my talk today is The Brown Dwarf Kinematics Project. It was also the title of my thesis. And the hope that I have that you all walk away from here with is you will see how important, how critical brown dwarfs are to studying directly imaged exoplanets. Um, a lot of the work that I'm going to tell you about today is part of this research group, the BDNYC. These are subway, New York City subway letters that we made that we got called out on by the New York City subway people for some reason, because we were trying to sell t-shirts online with the logo. Anyway, um, it's not, I, we're not able to do it anymore because of copyright, even though they give you these letters. Um, but so the BDNYC is the research group that I co-run with Kelly Cruz and Emily Rice, and I'm going to highlight the work of many of our excellent grad students um, and uh, a postdoc in the group today. So I'll highlight that throughout. So I'm going to start with what I think is one of the most important things to realize. It's, we're in this really exciting period in astronomy right now, and I call it the era of exoplanet characterization. And this is largely enabled by missions or instruments like the Gemini Planet Imager, Sphere, Project 1640, which is on Palomar, and the big guns, JWST. So right now, there's only a handful, say, of directly imaged exoplanets that we know of. Uh, but we're about to get what I call fire hosed with data on directly imaged exoplanets. And in order to understand what is happening with those exoplanets, um, brown dwarfs are the key. So what are the kinds of questions you might ask of your directly imaged data? What can you know about an exoplanet? Well, here is a, um, a picture of one of the most famous directly imaged exoplanets. It's 2 mass 1207, uh, 2 mass 1207b, which is this 3 to 8 Jupiter mass planet, which actually is orbiting a brown dwarf. Um, and then this is the artist's rendition of it. And I'm going to come back to this one a couple of times in this talk because it's a pretty important directly imaged exoplanet. But the kinds of questions that we can answer with directly imaged data is what's, what's the effective temperature of the object? What's in the atmosphere? How do you characterize that atmosphere? How massive is your object? How old is your object? How did it form? How many are there? So all of these questions that you're going to want to answer with your directly imaged data, you absolutely hands down have to use brown dwarfs to help you answer these questions. So for those that aren't lovers of brown dwarfs in the room like I am, uh, I'm going to give you just a little bit of background on them. So brown dwarfs were theorized in the 1950s um, or so. And the idea of them came about in, we know how stars form, collapse of giant molecular cloud, fragmenting off pieces. But at some point, a piece is going to be so small or so little mass in it that as it collapses and tries to compress, electron degeneracy pressure is going to kick in, halt the collapse, and the object isn't going to be able to get the core hot enough for nuclear burning. 
Therein lies the brown dwarfs. They are these degenerate objects that are not able to attain a core temperature high enough for nuclear burning. Uh, they come in three different flavors, flavors as I call them. There's the L types, the T types, and the Y types. And I'm going to try and refer to them as just types because as you'll see, these are classes of objects for which all directly imaged exoplanets fall under. So these are not just brown dwarf types. These are also exoplanet types. Um, the L types are the hottest. T types used to be the coolest, but they got surpassed about four years ago when this entirely new class of objects, the Y dwarfs, was discovered. So we have the most number of known objects in the L types because they're the hottest class, so they're the most numerous, they're the easiest to find, uh, 1,500 to 3,000 degrees Kelvin or so. Uh, the least number of the Y dwarfs, there's only about 17 known, they cover this crazy cold temperature range of 250 to 500 degrees Kelvin. For most of this talk, I'm going to be focused on the L types, but be prepared for the end, which is an awesome ending, I think, of this talk, I hope. Uh, and that's when I introduce some really exciting science that we're doing with the Y type objects. Um, a few other things that are important about brown dwarfs uh, is when you compare them to Jupiter. And oftentimes, that's what we end up talking about. Jupiter and brown dwarfs, they are synonymous. When we, start, when we talk about their mass, it's always in terms of Jupiter masses. This is a little cartoon as if you could find yourself floating above, hovering above the, the surface of Jupiter, looking down towards deeper, hotter, denser layers. Jupiter has an effective temperature of 125 degrees Kelvin or so. The upper layer of Jupiter has these ammonia clouds, these sulfide ice clouds, water ice clouds. Then you get to methane gas, and then you start getting into these weird silicate condensate grain clouds in the deeper, hotter, denser layers. The way you can think of brown dwarfs and our understanding of their atmospheres as stripped off versions of Jupiter. So up the temperature, so T dwarf temperatures say at 500 degrees Kelvin, and essentially, you've stripped off the top layers. The ammonia layers, the water ice clouds, gone. So what exists in the upper layer of the photospheres of T-dwarfs, which dominates their spectral energy distributions, is methane gas. L-dwarfs, which is a lot of what I'm going to talk about today, uh, is the deeper, even denser, hotter layers of Jupiter, CO gas, and then these crazy condensate clouds, liquid iron metal drops, um, iron metal liquid clouds, magnesium silicates, perovskite, corundum. And corundum, of course, if you get the right impurities in there, you've got rubies and sapphires. Uh, so those are the clouds that exist on these kinds of objects. Um, this plot here, I think, is the absolute most important plot that I can show you as to why brown dwarfs and planets need to be studied together, or why they're so important to each other. Uh, I show this in every single talk. Most brown dwarf talks will have this plot in here. On the x-axis here, you have age from young objects all the way out to old objects. And on the y-axis, you've got effective temperature here. Each one of these lines shows you an um, equal mass line, and it shows you with time how the temperature would be changing. And I've color coded it here with our kind of uh, our, our definitions, our loose definitions of the boundaries between brown dwarfs and uh, planets at 13 Jupiter masses, between low mass stars and brown dwarfs at 75 Jupiter masses, where for the brown dwarfs, you get deuterium burning. No deuterium burning for planets, they just cool. And of course, low mass stars will eventually get to the point where they get stable hydrogen burning and they stay uh, at a constant temperature. Now, when you look at this, you should see the problem. The problem is that if you don't know the age of your object, you actually do not know what you're studying. Because, follow the line, find your favorite L-type object in the field, uh, 
and get a spectrum of it so you've got some sort of proxy for maybe the effective temperature because effective temperature is notoriously difficult to measure. Uh, so you use your proxy. If that thing were a um, young giant exoplanet, a juvenile age brown dwarf, or even an old low mass star, every one of those objects has the same effective temperature. And effective temperature is the primary culprit for shaping all of your observable features because it regulates your atmospheric chemistry. So it shapes what you see when you look at an object. Now, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to tell you how we figure out things are young. But for now, just see that this could have been seen as a problem where you don't know what you've got, so it makes it really difficult. But you can take the flip side of that. So rather than worry about not knowing what kind of object you have, the brown dwarfs are way easier to study because you don't have to block the light of a bright star out. You can just dig in and study the object. And so with this, we're able to use the brown dwarf population to inform what you will expect out of your hot, young, giant exoplanets. Speaking of which, here's a collection of some of the superstars in directly imaged exoplanet land. Um, this is, there's only a handful or so that are known. I want to say about 10 that we're studying in earnest. And these are some of the superstars. I've already mentioned 2 mass 1207b here. There's Beta Pictoris b. There is AB Pictoris b. And then this super duper star, the only directly imaged multiple planetary system, HR8799 system. Um, each one of these has, uh, they're young, which will be important for the rest of this talk, because you have to go after young stars because that's when the planets are hot enough that our current instrumentation could actually uh, find the exoplanet. Their effective temperatures are between 1,000 and 2,000 degrees Kelvin. That is smack dab in brown dwarf territory. They are exactly the kinds of objects that we've been studying for years and years now. Spectral type ranges between L and maybe early T although they're younger, so their masses span between 3 and 15 Jupiter masses. So you can use the population of brown dwarfs that we know to help you understand the data as it comes in on all of these exoplanets. Now I'm going to tell you just this is story time moment here. Um, brown dwarfs have been studied in earnest observationally since about 1995. That's the first time that Gliese 229b was looked at as a bona fide T-type object. Uh, and after that, you had a pileup with the two micron all sky survey coming on. A lot of brown dwarfs were identified. So at first, it was great finding lots and lots of the L's and the T's. And as they were found, bunches of them started to pop up as looking weird. And they were kind of noted in the literature but tossed aside as like, that one looks a little bit strange. Why they look strange um, becomes very important. And in, in many ways, the outliers of any population end up informing you, uh, informing you about your overall population by leaps and bounds. And so that's where I came in, in kind of picking up on a bunch of the outliers to say, OK, what's the deal with these? Um, and I'll explain what they were now. So here's a look. A common way we look at uh, the brown dwarf population is the spectral type. And you'll notice I'm going to be focused on the L types for a lot of this talk because almost every single directly imaged exoplanet, with the exception of maybe one, falls as an L type object. That may very well change, but for right now, it's the L types that we all have to care about. Uh, on the y-axis here is the near to mid-infrared color, so the 2 mass J minus the y's W2. And what I show you here is the trend of the colors for the, the distribution by spectral type. And what was noted was that you have this normal, normal in the gray boxes with the black dots being the median, and then there was this spread with objects that were red word of that and blue word of that. And one of the things that I noted, and several others have noted now, is that the, when I isolated off the red types, I found that uh, in a population, a kinematic population analysis, I found that they were kinematically younger 
than the overall population. And the blue ones show the opposite. The blue ones looked kinematically older than the mean of the population. Now, then going back and matching that with the oddballs that were being tossed and thrown as like spectrally these look weird, um, became the sample that I've been focused on. This sample of L, ob L dwarfs with fe spectral features that were anomalous, they turned out to be red, and it turns out that their spectral anomalies can be associated with low surface gravity features, hence a younger population of brown dwarfs. Uh, here's what they looked like spectrally. Um, this is average templates at each L spectral subtype from L0 down to L5 here. Um, this is normal, and then this was the low gravity sequence. So when your eye, when you look at this, you might say, I oh, look pretty similar to me, but I look at L dwarf so much that when I see the red ones plop down, I'm like, holy moly, we got some outliers here. Um, and I can highlight for you how you pull out those differences. The main one is at H band. H band shows a really triangular shape here, very different. This elbow is almost gone uh, that you usually see at about 1.6 microns. Then if you look in, zoom in on the vanadium oxide line, or absorption feature, you see it's deeper, bolier for the lower gravity objects. Potassium lines, shallower, narrower. All of these are signatures of a low surface gravity. Now at this point, we have two methods for designating what low gravity features we're seeing. And the jargon that you'll need for the rest of the talk, as defined here, is that we can take all of the spectra, line them up, and come up with two categories. There's the normal objects that would be the black, uh, the black lines in here. Then we've got the extremes, which we've called very low gravity, very low surface gravity, or the gammas. And then in between normal and very low gravity, there's an intermediate stage, which we call intermediate gravity or beta. So you'll hear me refer to gammas or betas, and the hope was that, all right, we got this. We've got gammas as very low surface gravity, so they must be the youngest. And then we've got betas in between, so they must be intermediary. But the spoiler alert is that is going to fall apart when I start age calibrating this sample. Um, all right, so how do I age calibrate it? Well, the one thing that I worked on, as I said, I grabbed onto the outlier population, and I started going after measuring fundamental parameters, because that's the best way that you can figure out what's going on with the population. So in 2006, I initiated the Brown Dwarf Kinematics Project, the BDKP, and uh, we've had multiple programs going on, radio velocity program, parallax program, proper motion program. The goal was to measure parallaxes for all brown dwarfs within 20 parsecs, to do a number of things, but also to include a select sample of scientifically interesting sources that we thought we could do great things with. One of which, which is the main sample I'm telling you about today, are these low surface gravity young ones. And so why would you do that? Here's a 3D simulation that was made for me by Adric Riedel, who's a postdoc in our group at the BDNYC. And this is flying you around UVW velocity space in the nearby vicinity of the sun. And we zoom in and around the collections of stars, young stars that are near the sun. So these are color-coded. These stars are all over the place. It's not like they're clumping. You're not seeing clustering of these objects for the most part. They cover some of which, Abidor is all over the sky in the north and the south, Beta Pictoris, uh, same thing. But in the nearby vicinity of the sun, you get these collections of stars that once you measure their full kinematics, you're able to say that they're moving with each other. And we've been able to go after the higher mass stars in these groups in order to age calibrate them. A few of us in this room were at a meeting last week, the Young Stars and Planets Near the Sun group, where there were some arguments as to the exact ages of some of these groups. So it's an ongoing question as to the ages, but no one denies that a lot of these groups are young, that are near the sun. So a couple of these that I'll show you here, TW Hydra, again, superstar, 2MAS 1207B, planetary mass companion. Um, then I'm, I'm showing you the groups and highlighting them for you by the exoplanet that's in them. So HR8799 system is in Columba, Beta Pictoris B is in Beta Pictoris. So each one of these groups, 
uh, has been the target of direct imaging campaigns because these are the nearest, youngest stars to the sun. So of course, that's where we've been finding the planets. And now what we've done is by taking that group of planets, or brown dwarfs, that showed the low surface gravity features, measuring their kinematics, essentially what I have uncovered is the siblings of the exoplanets, the ones that are in the same groups. So as I said, brown dwarfs are the key to understanding the, uh, the exoplanets. And you could say just understanding regular brown dwarfs would help you. But the best thing that you could find is brown dwarfs that were younger as well, because then you could be doing a one-to-one -one comparison. Um, so that is what we have uncovered at this point, the siblings of the exoplanets. And now I'm going to pull that group apart for you and show you how we are tearing into the fundamental parameters of all of these uh, awesome objects in the groups. And the first place I'm going to start with that is in the parallax sample. So here's another little movie that I rendered for you, as if we were flying around five parsecs away from the sun or so. Uh, you can see the constellation lines are all distorted because we've moved away from the sun. We have at this point a, a little more than 300 late type M, L, T, and Y parallaxes through various programs, my own and several other people that have done amazing things with parallaxes. Um, and even though Gaia is going to save the world and give us uh, as many parallaxes as any of us have, has ever dreamed of, uh, it will not get to the brown dwarfs. They're too faint for Gaia. So those people that do brown dwarf parallaxes are still in a job after Gaia comes out because you still need to do those from the ground or maybe space-based missions. Um, but let's take the brown dwarf parallax sample and pull it apart to pull out some trends here. And I'll start by showing you what's probably the most famous of all brown dwarf um, parallax diagrams that I can show you. And that's spectral type here. And I'm showing you everything right now, from M's all the way down to the Y's, and then absolute magnitude at J. And part of the reason why it's so famous is because of this totally bizarre thing that happens. As you're getting to later spectral type, you're getting cooler, and then all of a sudden, your flux, the amount of flux that you're getting changes. Now you get this bump. It's called the J-band bump. Um, and that it happens when you go from L-types to T-types. Uh, that is a fascinating area of brown dwarf science, and it's worth a totally different colloquium. So I'm not going to focus on that one here. What I want you to focus on is the M to the L transition. And in this figure, I've pulled everything together by their spectral subtype. So if spectral subtype is a proxy for effective temperature, it should be including a lot of the things that go into changing your observable properties. But as you can see here, there's a lot of diversity in this figure. That diversity is driven by secondary parameters. Secondary parameters like, I can break that up for you because I know of some of these, Binaries. So in this case, you've got a number of objects that you're getting two for the price of one in this figure, in that there's overluminous because there's two in there. There's subdwarfs, which are these older objects in this population. And then the most important are these young objects. So these young, low surface gravity objects that we're measuring the parallaxes for. And when this figure first started to come out, it was really boggling. Now, I'm going to zoom in on it and show you exactly why that was. Uh, and now, I'm going to start color coding it by the groups that, these, that I'm able to assign these objects to. And I'm going to pull them apart by the beta and the gamma designation. So let's zoom in on the M to the Ls. And now, I'm going to take you through band by band what we see for these objects. So this, now I've taken off normal objects and I've just fit a polynomial to it so that you are not distracted by those. All you're seeing here are the young type objects. And they're color coded now by the groups that I've placed them in, AB Doratus, Toucan Horologium, Beta Pictoris. And then I'm showing you the symbols for the gammas and the betas, reminding you that the gammas were the very low gravity ones that we suspected as being the youngest, and the betas were intermediary. 
first thing to note that I can just pull out of this is that there's gammas and betas in groups of the same age. So we've got something wrong there, meaning that whatever the low surface gravity features are, you can see in Tukhor, for instance, you've got both gammas and betas. Same thing in Abiduratus, the oldest group. If they're gray here, it means that they have low surface gravity features, but I can't place them in any group at this point. I don't know where they belong, but I do suspect that they're young. Second and most important thing is that something weird's happening where the young M dwarfs do something very different than the young L dwarfs. So that the young M dwarfs, I'm sticking with J band at this first plot, they're overbright, whereas the young L dwarfs are what I call underbright. And let's see, this is only a J band though. Now I'm gonna take you through band by band how that changes. On the, on the bottom here, I'm showing you the residuals from how different the objects are from normal, from what the mean of field objects is. So this little, little um, flip through will go through band by band, J, H, K, and then, so the two mass magnitudes, W1, W2, and then W3. Whenever I get to W3, I get so excited, I can't wait to see what's gonna happen at W4, but none of the brown dwarfs are bright enough to see in W4, so. Can't, we don't have that data yet. Uh, but what you're watching is essentially a flux redistribution. So that you'll, if, especially if you see the L-type objects, which were boggling us at J-band, by the time they get to W3, it's different. They're above the sequence. So now I'm gonna dive into what that whole spectral energy distribution might look like. But this, this was a fantastic sign for flux redistribution, especially for the late type L dwarfs, the young late type Ls. So what we've been doing is the best way to go at this is to fill in a complete spectral energy distribution for the parallax sample. So our team has been pulling together parallaxes from wherever we could get them, numerous groups with their parallaxes, so all of the parallaxes, and then collecting all the photometry, all of the spectra, whatever you can give me, I will take and I will include it in trying to construct one of these, um, what I think are some beautiful empirical spectral energy distributions. Um, they come from 25 different instruments. Uh, here's an example of one. And I wanna highlight that a lot of this, we've written a Python database to hold all of this. And a grad student I work with, Joe Filippazzo, who's at CUNY CSI, has been doing a lot of this work. You can see we filled in the spectral energy distribution with catalog photometry, SDSS, DSS, two mass, Ys, Spitzer if it had it, and then all of the spectra we could find from whatever instrument you could give us in order to create these beautiful spectral energy distributions. And I'm just gonna give you a little bit of spectral energy distribution eye candy by showing you a whole bunch of the ones that we have. So we call this the BDNYC Spectral Energy Distribution Library. Um, at this point, our tally is we're collecting anything that's M6 to T8 with a parallax. We have 172 objects in total, 46 of which are young. So these now are gonna be my, uh, my ability to compare what a young L-type looks like to a normal L-type by just the empirical data calibrated with the parallax. So here's an example of one, two L-type objects. One is this L4 gamma. So gamma, again, was the very low gravity objects. And then a normal L4. Uh, and what these two objects have in common is that they're typed the same way. They're both L4s. They're both, um, and they both have a very similar bolometric luminosity. Because the best thing I can do with this database of spectral energy distributions is then integrate under the curve and tell you what the bolometric luminosity is empirically. No bolometric corrections required. Uh, and what we find is that when you look at the two SEDs next to each other, the uh, young object is indeed, it's under bright when you compare one to one to the L4 and somewhere in the near infrared, that flux shifts until you get into the mid infrared where the object switches to being over bright. Um, and this was, this is awesome. We are, I'm so excited that we're finally able to show it like this. And what it is 
is, is this direct evidence that these young L-type objects, they're dustier. The, one of the things that can shift that flux to longer wavelengths is a dustier photosphere, or they have higher lying clouds. I'll say that those two things are hard to distinguish between each other. But grad student Kay Hiranaka, who's working with us at the BDNYC, she has been working on figuring out how to fit extinction laws to this differences in SEDs to say something about the grain properties of the clouds that might be dominant in these kinds of objects. And a little bit more evidence as to the dust in these objects is if I zoom in in the mid-infrared spectrum on one object that is my absolute favorite of all the young brown dwarfs. And you're not supposed to have favorites when it comes to children, and these are sort of children, but this is my favorite. So 2 mass 0355, I did a detailed study on it in 2013, and this is a mid-infrared spectrum that we haven't published yet, and what it shows when I compare it to a normal L5 is this whopping silicon grains absorption feature. You do not see that in a normal L5, you see it in this L5 uh, 2 mass 0355. And I want to just show you why I love 2 mass 0355 so much. Again, I'm showing 2 mass um, 1207b. Again, that's a beautiful, gorgeous, directly imaged exoplanet. And I can compare 2 mass 0355, uh, which is this the black line in here, to a normal, this is just a normal generic L5 object. And then you can compare it to 2 mass 1207b. And when I saw this at first, I was blown away. It looks so much like it, so much like it. The sharply peaked H-band here, the fit through J, through J band, the potassium line, the uh, iron hydride line, CO even, or there, there's differences in the J-band, which I think is a temperature difference between the two of them because they are slightly different temperatures. Um, but the CO is even very similar. But herein lies the wrench in all of this, is that, yeah, it's a lot like it, uh, but 2 mass 1207b is in TW Hydra. It's 10 million years old. 2 mass 0355 is in AB Doradus, and that is 150 million years old. That's a, pr that's a big difference in uh, age for these two objects. This plot is also kind of summarizing the, what still is a beautiful confusion that we have, spectral type versus the J minus W2, and showing you how the age distribution, meaning the oldest AB Doradus in orange here, to the youngest TW Hydra, where, and gammas and betas, they're all over the place. And the one thing to think about that I focus on a lot with 2 mass 0355 is that younger doesn't mean dustier. There's other things that are driving what's going on. Um, and I'll show you one of the other amazing things that comes out of this, back to the parallax sample. So back to those beautiful SEDs, and maybe what's helped us understand what might be causing some of these problems, is that I focus again on my spectral energy distribution sample. And as I said, one of the things that I can do is measure bolometric luminosities from those empirical bolometric luminosities. So we've gone ahead and done that, redone anything that had a parallax in a uniform way. Uh, this is the full brown dwarf spectral type from late type M all the way to Y type bolometric luminosity. Again, this is a paper that's been led by Joe Filippazzo, who's a grad student in our group. Uh, and from M into T to Y, you can see how regular bolometric luminosity goes. Now, if you look at what the young objects do, I can switch and see that. And what we have here is the young M dwarfs do what you suspect they should be doing. They're over luminous. This is classic of young things, right? They haven't contracted to their final radius yet. You expect them to be over luminous. But the L dwarfs, they don't do that. They are nor much more normal. Uh, we don't have enough T-types in order to say for sure. Um, so what does that mean? That's weird. What does that mean? Well, you can then look from bolometric luminosity to an effective temperature. Uh, and unfortunately, in order to do that, 
I, for the first time, would say we have to turn to the evolutionary models. So the radii come from evolutionary models at this point because we don't have direct brown dwarf radii. And really, there's two, maybe three, uh, that we can actually turn to for help here. But for the most part, we have to turn to the evolutionary models for help. Um, this is what the effective temperature relationships look for brown dwarfs. And now on to what the young objects look like. What you see is this very interesting, bizarre effect that the effective temperature of low gravity L-type objects directly applicable to your favorite directly imaged exoplanet are up to 300 degrees Kelvin cooler than an equivalent older object. So they're cooler than you would have expected them to be. Um, a problematic result in some ways because the effective temperature, again, is how we're trying to understand exactly what's going on with these objects. Uh, let me put this in context with the exoplanets for you. Another extremely famous figure that you'll see in any directly imaged exoplanet paper, and that's the near-infrared color magnitude diagram, J minus K versus the absolute magnitude in J. And what this is populated with here is the M dwarfs into the uh, L dwarfs and then over into the T dwarfs. And then highlighted for you on the right-hand side in this sequence are the collection of directly imaged exoplanets labeled here as well as the young brown dwarfs. Now, I'm going to change the colors up for you and show it to you age calibrated. So just guiding your eye, this is what our normal sequence down and then over. When you go from the L to T transition, this is where that J-bump thing happened. This is largely an atmospheric effect. Um, color code them now by their groups. And what's interesting here, which is rather obvious, is that the sequence of the young objects are redward and under where you would expect them to be. And that I've been pointing it out then throughout a lot of my plots here as to why we think it is flux redistribution, probably driven by these dusty photospheres. Um, color coded now. So the youngest objects in here are some of these planetary mass companions that have been found in nearby star forming regions, so less than five million years. They certainly look like they push the trend redward. Then the more important thing to notice is when you get towards the bottom of this entire sequence, where we're just filling out with some of our young brown dwarfs. And what the idea was here is this turnover happens between L types and T types, where you get a cloud clearing, objects get cooler, and all of a sudden they start losing clouds because in those that first cartoon diagram I showed you, methane gas starts to dominate. But as you get to younger and younger and later and later objects, 2 mass 1207b is the extreme of which what's happening is that transition where it goes from an L-type object to a T-type object seems to be happening at a later and later absolute magnitude. Or, in other words, it's happening at a later and later effective temperature, at a cooler effective temperature. The clouds are sticking around for longer. The clouds are problematic in all of your observable features. OK, now I'm also going to put this in the context of the masses of these objects. This is now a bolometric luminosity, which we've nicely accumulated for a lot of objects from those beautiful SCDs, and the age of the object. And now I have uh, labeled for you this collection of exoplanets. And the green objects on here are all of my young, the young brown dwarf sample. Uh, and all the red lines are the same as the first plot I showed you, where this is planetary mass objects. So this line in here is a 10 Jupiter mass object. So you can see many of the directly imaged exoplanets are landing in here. And then these green triangles, which are the age calibrated sample of brown dwarfs, they are creeping in to planetary mass. So at this point, we've not only found a collection of young brown dwarfs that you can use to compare to your favorite exoplanet to try and characterize its atmosphere, its clouds, its effective temperatures, but now they're also equivalents. 
But these objects are isolated. They don't have a parent star hanging around with them. They're alone. So that in its own right is a movement in our own studies to try and understand what the mass function is for these groups, what the mass function is at the end of maybe planetary uh, star formation processes, or maybe it's the high end of planetary mass functions. Maybe some of these objects were ejected. Maybe some of these objects have been part of a planetary system at one point. That's a heavily discussed topic right now in this field. Uh, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about it if you have ideas. Uh, and I want to promote one other really exciting thing that's happening in this science, and that is what I showed you is the sample as we knew it. As I described it at the beginning when I was telling you my story of how oh, these objects were kind of thrown out and we didn't know much about them, now we're able to do a pointed search for these objects. We know what to look for now. And I've been working with a grad student, Jonathan Gagné, who's at the University of Montreal, who's developed this really beautiful tool called Banyan 2, which lets you use Bayesian analysis to determine if an object could be part of a moving group. And so we've been doing a pointed search for these kinds of objects. Rather than grabbing other people's throwaways, now we're searching for them. And this is a histogram of a paper that Jonathan just submitted uh, where the green is primarily the sample I was just talking to you about, uh, and then the orange is the additions that we're about to make in this brand new paper. Uh, and so you could ask, man, seems like you guys are finding a lot of these things. And we've been asking ourselves the same question. Man, we seem to be finding a lot of these objects. What does it all mean? So we need to do a good mass function analysis of these objects to understand if we're finding them in real abundance. Uh, and I'm going to show you a histogram of the masses of the sample that we have in this, in this paper that was just submitted. And what it shows is this is the estimated mass. This is not a mass function. This is not a mass function. This is a distribution of the objects that we've discovered and they are objects where we have placed into moving groups so we have an idea of the age. We have to confirm their moving group membership. So these are not as well constrained as the other ones I was showing you where I went after for years and got radial velocities and parallaxes. Uh, but they have Bayesian inferences tell us what groups they're in so I have an idea of the age. And this is the numbers. And bizarrely, what we have f uncovered, and this has to be a bias in the way that we're doing it, we're sure of that, but we are seeing an overabundance of objects in this 13 Jupiter mass range. That's the largest number that we were finding when they were at about 13 Jupiter masses. So we're investigating this. The most important thing for us to do right now is to do a detailed, really nice mass function analysis of something like the Toucana Horologium group, where we have the most number of objects. Um, but this is something exciting on the horizon that uh, you're going to see hopefully in the next few months. Masses come from uh, the ages of the groups that we were able to put them in and uh, doing this analysis. Bolometric luminosities that we're able to estimate from their spectra, estimating their distances um, by their kinematic membership because we don't have parallaxes, and then using the ages. So that's where the masses come from. Okay. Uh, in the last few minutes, I'm going to um, take you through a little evolution in time. This is the sample. This is the sample you need to compare to your directly imaged exoplanets to. These are the objects that are the siblings to the directly imaged exoplanets. 1,000 to 2,500 degrees Kelvin, here you go. 10 to 130 million years, 6 to 30 Jupiter masses. We've got a ton of data. I'm offering up this uh, database of spectral energy distributions that we have of these objects that have parallaxes. It's a beautiful sample. We're still culling out all of the information we can from this data. But the next question you might say is, OK, you found them when they're young. What happens a couple billion years later to these things? They're isolated brown dwarfs. You should be able to find them anywhere, right? So fast forward time a few billion years, what would these objects look like? Well. They'd look like this. This is the collection of Y-type objects, 250 to 500 degrees Kelvin objects. 
Their masses, we don't know their ages. I can't tell you what the ages of these objects are because they're not in a group and they're not associated with a star. So I can't tell you what, uh, what, the, mass, what the ages of these objects are. But I'm going to show you the best one of all of these that will, nothing we can do about it, it's just a low mass object, and that's this bad boy here, 0855, our newest neighbor discovered just last year. When I was here last year, I was going gaga over this thing because it had just been discovered and I knew how exciting this was going to be for doing atmospheric uh, analysis of cold objects. Um, so Kevin Lumen discovered it in just middle of last year. It's just at over two parsecs, fourth closest system to the sun. No matter what age you put it, Add, put it at 10 billion years, the most this could possibly weigh is 10 Jupiter masses. So we say it's 3 to 10 Jupiter masses. It's basically a 250 degree Kelvin uh, object. Uh, this is a June 21st Spitzer image of it. This is a January 20th. This thing is hauling across the sky at 8 arc seconds per year. Third highest proper motion. It will clear the face of the full moon in a century in two centuries. We could watch it move across. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, this object is as exciting, and it's one of the most exciting things that I've ever seen. I love everybody's work in here. This is beautiful. But this is one of the most exciting things I've ever seen come out in astronomy, and it could be because I'm in love with these kinds of objects. Um, and in part, I love it because we're not able to directly image exoplanets that are solar type age around solar type stars. It's not possible given current facilities. But we've got this guy. And so I had a paper that came out, I'm going to show you the results of in a second. When I put the paper out, Mark Marley tweeted this figure. So this is a Twitter, this is a Twitter reference. Uh, but this is temperature versus mass for a collection of um, a collection of RV exoplanets, uh, planets that you've never looked at. And at the top here, it shows you the kind of clouds you might expect. Methane clouds, ammonia clouds, water ice clouds, the alkali clouds. But the water ice clouds, one of the most important opacity sources that will come at you when you're directly imaging Jupiter-like planets. And 0855 was smack dab in the, effect, in the temperature regime where you should see them. So I was at Magellan. I don't think it was like a week before I left here last year. Uh, I went to Magellan. Um, this is the Magellan telescopes everybody here is familiar with, Bada, Clay. Uh, and for the past five years, I've been running what I call the coolest ground-based parallax program that's possible with the four-star imager. Um, don't mind the snow that was on the ground in this picture. This wasn't the best seeing night that I had. Um, and we've been, last year, we had a paper out. Chris Tinney led it with 17 greater than T9 dwarf parallaxes. But we had this parallax program running. I was headed to the telescope, and I decided just to dig into this object. Um, and what I was able to get, what I knew I could get, when I'm talking to the modelers, was like, if these have water ice clouds, how am I going to be able to tell? And they came back at me get a near-infrared detection of the object. A near-infrared detection of the object will tell you whether or not the water ice clouds are there because there's enough of a difference because of what the water ice clouds end up doing to the flux. You'll be able to say one way or the other on, uh, when you compare to models. So here was my image. Um, the object, when it was discovered, was here. It was actually sitting among this uh, cluster of contaminants galaxies. I know people study galaxies here. I'm sorry, but that was really annoying. Um, it was sitting among them. Uh, and then it marched its way over. These were Kevin's two positions that I marked for you. And lucky for me, right four days before or five days before I took my image, uh, NEOWISE, which is the reactivated NEOWISE satellite, uh, WISE satellite, took, an, took another image of this object. So I knew exactly where it should be. And hence, I was able to say, given that I was struggling with, do I have a detection? Do I not have a detection? Uh, I'm not used to dealing with things that aren't like 100 sigma. So um, and that's not totally true. I can deal with 50 sigma. But <laughs> three to five sigma was not my comfort zone. 
Uh, but it's exactly where you would expect it to be. John Johnson actually came and helped convince me that, yes, Jackie, it's okay. You do have a detection. A lot of people actually had to be talked into, your, this is a good detection, I can tell you. This image maybe isn't giving it to you the best it could, given this projector. But I have some other analysis I could show you why this is a nice, solid detection. Even if you don't believe me, you can believe the five sigma lower limit on this thing. So I place it. On a near-infrared color magnitude diagram, this time the W2 magnitude versus J minus W2, showing the models. This is the rest of our parallax sample that we put out in uh, the Tinney Faraday 2014 paper. Um, sulfide clouds, which end up disappearing as you get to lower temperature. The blue lines show you the water ice clouds. And then the red would be no clouds at all. So my five sigma detection was at the edge, and then my three sigma detection was in the middle of the predictions for the water ice cloud. So it may be the first object, it should certainly be the first object that should have them definitively. Um, but this was our near infrared detection. So for the young objects, you get these crazy silicate clouds. It's hot, but when you evolve these things past a couple billion years, they're a totally different beast of objects, but still really, really interesting to look at and study their atmospheric chemistry. This will certainly, hopefully, be the future of when we're able to directly study Jupiter-like objects around solar-type stars. So last, last comments here. The future of this should be we want to test this unbound planetary mass function. Uh, this is a plot from Kirkpatrick et al. 2012. When the Y dwarfs were discovered, he did a mass function analysis, and essentially the numbers came out lower than we expected. One brown dwarf for every six stars. Unexpectedly low, we thought there was going to be more. That was before 0855 popped out. Are there more 0855s out there? Um, I'll say you can look on AstroPH from last week. I had a paper come out that was discussing, the, it's, it's not quite a science paper, it's a paper on the future uses of the WISE mission. Uh, at a, a, a conference that I was on the SOC for, I ran an interactive session to gather people's opinions about what the future uses of the WISE database are. And one of the main thing that people wanted to know is, are there more, what is the end of the mass function? Are there more objects like 0855 out there? Um, and the other thing is, we need to look at the mass function of some of these groups. This plot, which is, again, just a histogram, it's not a mass function yet, we are finding a lot of these very low mass objects. Um, so to end with these initial questions that I threw up here is, what can you know about an exoplanet? So temperature, atmosphere, mass, old, age, how did it form, how many are there? Some of the things that I can tell you is that, one, they're up to 300. They're cooler than you think. Most likely, in the, if you're finding an L-type, it's cooler than you think it is. Uh, the atmosphere is going to have these thick or maybe high-laying clouds um, that are going to really mess with you. Uh, how massive is it? The future, a dynamical mass measurement of one of my, my objects, that's going to tell us what the masses of these things are. That is definitely something we have to do. First, we have to find one of them that's binary. Uh, but when we do, we will get a dynamical mass measurement. Uh, how old is it? These moving groups are telling us Gaia will probably crack that game wide open. How did it form? Well, future here, maybe what we need to do is chemically tag the brown dwarfs and the exoplanets, be able to look at abundance differences between the two of them to say maybe one will be very obvious how it formed in a disk and one formed through the collapse of a cloud. Uh, and how many are there? There's more than you think, I think. I th that, that sounded weird. Whatever. More than you think. Uh, and then the big blob of all of the things you should take away, which is a lot. There's a population of objects that are isolated. Same moving groups as the planet. Uh, they share similar properties. Bolometric luminosity, effective temperature, near-infrared color, spectra, mass, all of it. They're sharing it. Let's use the brown dwarfs. They're the best sources to help you characterize your objects. I am opening this database that we're collecting up to the direct imaging exoplanet. Anybody, that you, if you want to play with even Galaxy people, come play with the SEDs. They're great. Uh, and the takeaway from the analysis of this age-calibrated sample is, is large. Flux redistribution, 
direct evidence that you've got the clouds. The red or near infrared color doesn't mean you've got a younger dustier object, so that's still confusing. Gravity alone isn't driving your surface gravity features. There's a difference in the young M's and the young L's, uh, and that they're 300 degrees co cooler. So brown dwarfs are key to understanding the tail end of star formation and characterizing the current and future population of giant directly imaged exoplanets. I hope everybody loves brown dwarfs right now. <laughs> and I'll end there. All right, uh, we have time for some questions. Charles? Given some of what you were showing in those diagrams um, with, uh, again, spectral type, given the richness and diversity of the spectral possibilities here, are those spectral types reliable enough to be really useful in the long term? Can you yeah. uh, briefly repeat the question? Oh, the yeah, guess? sure. So the question is basically, are the spectral types that we're using and comparing, are they really reliable, given that we see so much scatter and diversity? I'll say that spectral typing is an art, and um, uh, I, I believe that we are pulling things together that do look similar enough that they are a subtype. There is consistency between the optical spectral type and the near-infrared spectral type. So that builds a little bit of confidence in this. It's not perfect, though. So it is with a grain of salt that I say, spectral type is what I can empirically measure. I mean, I can go off and match up all the objects that look the same. But there is an inherent scatter in there and diversity in there that, um, that I, I think we need to... Uh, we definitely need to pay attention to. But optical and near are do match. So there's something to uniformity in that part of the data, if that answers your question. Why was there only one L2? It was a big dip yeah. in your histogram. Oh, yeah. You know what? Somebody, I, I don't know. Uh, excellent question. <laughs> the, um, I don't know why we've only found one L2. That doesn't make any sense, because there's no reason why we should be biased against it. Actually, the only the one thing there is that where we spectral type these things, awesome, only fifty-five. There we go. There we go. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, I know, weird, right? So uh, that could be a bias on our part, where it may, maybe it's an L L one and a half. We may be biased towards the L one, L three in our <coughs> templates. So this would go back to Charles's question on. Uh, how well we're doing with spectral typing. We can do plus or minus one type. So, I mean, it's all melted a little bit in there. Okay. Another one. So that feature, you were careful to say that you didn't have a mass function. Yeah, for history. Jupiter masses. That's right where you're transitioning from deuterium burning object. Yeah. Doesn't it just suggest there's a calibration issue there? Well, it, it does depend on the models because the models, and that is a really messy place in the models. Um, but it is a narrow place in the models because we know the ages really well. Um, it is, uh, that is a place where the models have kind of narrow range in their predictions. Yeah. So that messy region, uh, if you go back to that cooling diagram, yeah. why is it that you get that weird overlap near about 13? Uh, yeah, right there. The so degeneracy the green in here. Lines dip, dipping below some of your red lines. Right yeah. yeah. I think that's deuterium burning degeneracy. Um, mm. I This was actually pointed out by Brendan Bowler in a paper that he did in 2013 that I don't think we've fully appreciated. It's something that the models predict, and I think it's related to the deuterium burning in here. Um, uh, it's weird, though. So even if you know the age, you're still going to be degenerating that, in that region? Yep. Okay. Yes, 100%. So that is, that again is something that we have to, I wish we didn't have to depend on the models here, uh, but. Is there anything spectral in the spectrum that distinguishes those overlapping? No, no they look the same. As, at deuterium, there's no signature of it that we can measure. So um, these would look exactly the same. And their ages, and they're, they're just, they're indistinguishable at this point. Oh. Those uh, arrow models are awfully old. 
Uh, yeah, so these models are the Simone and Marley 2008 models. Oh. I showed at the beginning. You showed the Burroughs. Yeah, I did show the Burroughs models. Um, that, I mean, that is outdated, but that was my, you know, I'm going to show this that the, for the full range of objects. I don't, I don't use that to do science, though. I only use that as a representative. This is why we have a degeneracy. The degeneracy is still there. Burroughs are not, but um, I, when I type, the best thing I can do is use the Simone and Marley models, and then the the um, the dashed lines here are actually the new Baraf 2015 models that came out uh, last month. Because the Simone and Marley don't actually go to a high enough mass to cover some of the um, higher mass brown dwarfs that we have in here. Okay, one more. I got a fun question for you. Oh, good. For those who are planning summer vacations, what ranges of weather might, might we expect on some of these brown dwarfs? Ah, well, if you were to go to 0855, my favorite. Ah, 0355 is my favorite. That's like being inside a pottery kiln uh, at the highest setting, if you will. But 0855, you could go hang out there. That's like a nice day at the North Pole. <laughs> so. Um, I don't think you want to go to either of those places, I guess. Um, we don't have a young tea type yet that would be in that optimal sunny day in California yet. Uh, maybe we'll find that. But OE55, I think I would still go just to see what that thing looks like. Because it's so awesome. So I was actually wondering, uh, so what's going to be the engine for discovering more of, especially the wide dwarfs and the very coolest objects? I mean, yeah. uh, is there more to be mined out of the WISE data sets? Yeah, uh, I, the, the story of how 0855 was discovered is so awesome because Kevin is amazing in that he looked through all of the images to find that thing. And that um, the discovery here, as I said, it was the WISE team would have found it. It's not like this was impossible to find and wouldn't have been very obvious, but it was contaminated. So it was sitting, the WISE pixels are pretty big. So this was an unfortunate, unfortunate mishap for the WISE team in that they missed out on essentially what the mission in part was designed to find, you know, this kind of object. Um, but the, the next phase, which is awesome, which is why I would encourage you to check out this paper that I put on AstroPH on what we're doing with the WISE, uh, what you can do with the WISE mission. So WISE was reactivated, NeoWISE was reactivated. And what we can do is co-add the NeoWise data and WISE data. And then bringing those two things together, you can go deeper so that, okay, fine. Well, you're always going to have a problem if it's sitting on top of something else. Nature is going to screw you over. Nature, whatever, astronomy, or I don't know. The sky. Maybe. The sky, stars, galaxies, they'll always get in your way. But, um, yeah, these darn things out there, right? Um, but if you co-add the data, you can go deeper. So when, because this thing is at fourth closest system to the sun, um, we'd like to go a little bit further than that. Uh, and you'll be able to extract the proper motion and parallax catalog from that. And that, those things should pop off left and right, depending on how many that are out there. But um, right now, they, they haven't funded the MaxWise mission yet, if they're going to. And that will let you co-add. Right, right now, we have to do the co-adding on our own. So this awesome data set exists out there of the second epoch of Ys, and we haven't been able to. They may be sitting out there. We could be abundant with 0855 type objects. Um, so we'll see. All right. All right. Well, let's thank thank Jackie one more time.